When Billy Graham was a young evangelist, he had a close friend, a Canadian, a young preacher named Charles Templeton. Many people thought that Charles Templeton was a much better preacher than Billy Graham. The T Charles Templeton, Billy Graham, and one other man founded a group in, uh, called Youth for Christ, and they went to Europe and they preached all over Europe. Ironically, though, Billy Graham went on to be the greatest evangelist of his generation, and Charles Templeton turned out to be one of his generation's greatest atheists. Now, what happened? Well, there are many things that led to Templeton's atheism, but he says in his book that the straw that broke the camel's back was a picture on the cover of Life magazine. The picture was of a young African woman holding her dead baby in her arms as she looked up into heaven with a broken-hearted expression. And Templeton said, how is it possible to believe in a loving or caring creator when all this woman needed was rain? The fact that there's evil and suffering in the world is one of the main reasons many people say they reject the God described in the Bible. It's one of the biggest faith problems for many Christians. This morning, in the short time that we have, I want to try to be intellectually honest, faithful to the biblical message, and sensitive to people who are hurting right now. No one is ever going to be able to give you the definitive answer on the reason for suffering and evil, but that doesn't mean that we can't explore and think about some of the things that the Bible says about it. Now, this morning, I don't want to try to do anything that would dodge the seriousness of this problem. We live in a world where many people are suffering tremendously. They're suffering from disease. They're suffering from hunger. They're suffering from natural disasters. They're suffering from wars. The suffering's very real, and it's even on a massive scale. There's no way to minimize the pain of the earth. It's also a fact that if you're going to be true to the Bible, we have to declare what the Bible declares. First, that God is love. Not just that God has love, but that, that it's the very essence of who God is. The Bible also asserts that God is all-powerful, that He created the universe and all things. And the Bible says nothing is impossible for God. Now, those two facts lead to the problem. If there's terrible pain and suffering in the world, and there is, then how can there be a God who is, like the Bible describes, both all-loving and all-powerful, who allows all the suffering to go on? That's the problem. David Hume, the Scottish philosopher and skeptic, said, Epicurus' question still remains unanswered. Is God willing to prevent evil, but not able? Then he is impotent. Is he able, but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Well, whence then is evil? St stated in the terms of human logic, we assume that a good God would destroy evil, that an all-powerful God could destroy evil, Evil is not destroyed. Therefore, many draw the conclusion there couldn't possibly be a God who's both good and all-powerful. John Mac Mackey, an Oxford professor and an atheist, gives this classic statement a more complete and honest form when he says of the problem of evil and suffering, if God exists, there couldn't be evil unless God would have a reason for justifying his permitting it. Evil exists all around us. There is no sufficient reason we can discern for God justifying his permitting of evil. Therefore, God must not exist. But you see, in all syllogisms, you have one false premise, and that leads to a false conclusion. Mackey's very honest restatement of the problem hits precisely on the primary point I want to make this morning. 
The whole argument that there can't be both an all-loving and all-powerful God and pain and suffering in the world rests on the premise that we have both the intellectual ability and the perspective to judge whether or not there's a sufficient reason to allow evil and suffering to exist. Now, my first question is, why, when we have such a limited perspective and understanding even of the physical universe around us, do we believe that we have the perspective and the wisdom to judge God or to declare God to be non-existent because He doesn't do things the way we think He should? That seems pretty arrogant, as you may have heard me say before, if there's a God who is powerful enough to create us and the entire universe, the difference between us and God would be greater than the difference between you and an ant on top of your shoe by hundreds, by thousands of times. How would you explain your life, your motives, your words, your actions to that ant? You couldn't because an ant doesn't have the understanding of your world. He doesn't have the intellectual capacity. He, he, he has no frame of reference to be able to judge you and what you are doing. And in fact, that's exactly what the Bible tells us in Isaiah 55, 8, 9. God is quoted by the prophet as saying, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, is that just some, the, the, the same kind of cop-out that we use when we tell our children or we, we say to a friend, oh, you wouldn't understand anyway? No, because God just doesn't tell us, well, you wouldn't understand anyway. He tries to give us as much insight as we can understand if we'll just listen. Let me ask you three questions. First of all, does the fact that we can't see a good reason to allow evil and suffering mean necessarily that there's not one? Alvin Plantinga, uh, uh, a professor at the University of Notre Dame, used an interesting illustration in his book, God, Freedom, and Evil, to make the point that as human beings, we have the ability to discern some things, but not others. If I were to say to you this morning, if there was an elephant in this sanctuary, we would surely know it. That would be true. Nobody could hide an elephant in this little sanctuary without us knowing about it. But if I were to say to you, if there were any car carbon-14 atoms in this room, we would, we would know about it. Well, that'd be false. We don't have the ability to see or sense the presence of atoms. I've told you before, we know now from quantum physics that we live in a universe that requires at least nine dimensions mathematically for things to be as they are. We only perceive four of them if you count time as a dimension, and it is. Even within those four dimensions, there exist many things like carbon-14 atoms that we can't perceive with just our physical senses. So it's certainly possible that there's a, there are good reasons to allow evil and suffering that are beyond our ability to perceive or to understand. Question two, isn't it too simplistic to assume that just because suffering hurts, that it's automatically bad? Suppose you were a space alien and you observed a young family, a young mother and father, taking their child to the doctor. And the doctor, you know, the first said, well, your child needs immunization. So then the alien sees you allowing this doctor to send large metal needles into your child, and your child is screaming bloody murder as the doctor gives shot after shot. And then does the doctor, you take them back in a few years, and the doctors say, oh, they have an infected uh, appendix, and the alien from outer space sees, you know, well, look, they let that doctor cut their child open and cut something out of the inside of the child. In other words, from the outside perspective, you're, you're being extremely cruel, but you allow that to happen because you know that it will result ultimately in better health and a longer life for your child. Question number three, how can an atheist justify her, her or his moral indignation at the state of the world if there's no absolute standard? If, if there's no God, if it's all just a matter of chance, if it all just happened, if it's all just survival of the fittest, well, without God, there is no standard. So who are you to say that anything is bad? You may think it's bad, but that's just your opinion. Someone else may think something else. That's what they say in our world. Well, you have your ideas. I have mine. There's no definite right or wrong. So how can you rail against God for allowing evil and suffering in a world that you, that you don't believe there's any standard or any God anyway? 
As Dostoevsky said, if there is no God, everything is permitted. The point I'm making is, if there's a God who's powerful enough to hold responsible for the condition of the world, then that God is so much greater than we are, it's at least conceivable that God has reasons to temporarily, and that's the key, because the Bible says that this current age of evil and suffering is only a temporary state. It's conceivable that God has reasons to temporarily allow evil and suffering in this world that are beyond our comprehension. If that's true, that means there are no theories or theologies that could give a comp comprehensive answer to the question of evil and suffering because the complete answer is not within our realm of understanding. But that doesn't mean that God hasn't attempted to give us enough understanding to enable us to trust Him, to have faith in God and His ultimate purposes, that God is good, that He does love us. So because God has revealed some things to us, we're going to look at three classic theodicies. Now, theodicy is a God defense. Christians throughout the ages have formulated responses to the problem of evil and suffering to help themselves and others understand how a loving and all-powerful God could allow evil and suffering as part of His creation. The first theodicy that I'm going to talk about is the punishment theodicy. This is not one I especially like, but it's one that has believed by a great number of people throughout the ages. It, it's simply that God allows the evil and suffering in the world because we rebel and disobey God. So any suffering you get in life, you deserve anyway as punishment for your own rebellion, for your own disagreement. In the grossest form, it says, you know, if you've got cancer, it's your fault. Even if it was genetically, well, I didn't, I didn't ever smoke. Why, did, why, why is it my fault? Well, it just is. It's your general evil that you're being punished for. And so a Puritan, you know, if you complain about, you know, that God is not being just and good to you, would say, well, you're just getting what you deserve for your, your, your rebelliousness in life. You're being punished. But you see, that doesn't square very well with the picture that we have. There is a day of judgment when God says he'll judge all evil. But John 3.16 reminds us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, not, and, and, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. God doesn't go around throwing lightning bolts when we sin. If He did, you and I would both all be smoking right now, you know, because uh, we all sin and all. So in one sense, I mean, yes, Human beings are responsible for much of the suffering in the world. The less extreme statement is given that human selfishness and greed and cruelty and rebellion, how can we expect there to be a better world? Most suffering in this world is caused to a great extent by the action or inaction of human beings. Let me give you some quick examples. Let's say that there's a terrible hurricane and hundreds of people are killed in the hurricane. Well, I mean, first of all, you chose to build your house on the beach or close to the beach, and you knew. Secondly, you know, the weather service has told you probably a week or two before, and certainly days before, that it was going to hit the coast. The local authorities have told you this is a Category 5 storm. You need to flee. But you decide, no, I'm going to ride out the storm. Now, when you drowned, is it God's fault or is it your fault? You build your house under a volcano. The ground shakes, smoke comes out. They tell you, you know, the volcano is going to blow. And one night while you're asleep, a pyroclastic cloud comes down and you die in your sleep, even before the lava gets to you from the pyroclastic fumes and all that come out of a volcano. You know, it, those, those are our decisions. Many times, let me give you two historical examples, that many times are, these kinds of things are blamed on God. In 1985, the Ethiopian famine, tens of thousands of people died of starvation in Ethiopia because they didn't have any rain. So obviously it's God's fault. Or at least people would say that, but the government of Ethiopia was given numerous warnings two years earlier that a famine was coming. And instead of doing anything about it, the Ethiopian government spent $200 million celebrating the communist takeover of the nation and did nothing to feed the people. You see, many times it's not just selfish developed nations that are, that are not helping others in the world. Billions of dollars of aid has been, have been sent to Africa in my lifetime. 
First time I taught school in Africa when I was 19 years old. Every time I go back, things are in a bigger mess than they were when I was there, you know, when I was 19. Why? Billions of dollars of aid's been sent. Well, because every one of these dictators of this little company and the countries and all these things, they all have Swiss bank accounts. And most of the money that gets sent, it ends up in their Swiss bank account in their pocket. And that's the problem all over the world in Gaza, you know. Oh, the people in Gaza are dying. Well, their leaders let them into that. They're in luxury hotels in different places in the Middle East, the heads of Hamas, while their people are dying. Or consider the deforestation of Senegal. TV ads told the local people that burning wood caused deforestation, that all the burning heats up the atmosphere, it dissipates the clouds, that retards the rain. But despite the fact that they were offered alternative sources of fuel, the local people continued to use newly cut wood because that's what they'd always done. You see, Romans 1, 18 through 20 tells us, while all people know in their hearts what is true and good, we continually choose to ignore God and the good, and therefore we are all without excuse. Someday when you stand before God in heaven and, and, and ask, God, why didn't you do anything about the hunger and the disease and the poverty and the war? God's going to look right back at you and say, why didn't you do anything? I created you. I gave you dominion over the world. You know, and, and you destroyed it and the people in it by your action and your inaction while you pursued your own selfish pleasures. So it's true to a much greater extent that most people want to recognize that a great deal of the mess the world is in is because of human beings and their choices to rebel. But the problem with saying that this is the definitive, complete answer for the problem of evil and suffering is, if suffering is punishment for our rebellion against God and God's laws, why is that punishment so random? Why so often do people who live relatively good lives seem to get so much pain and suffering in their lives, while people with, who live such bad lives often get so much happiness? That's called the problem of distribution. The biblical writers recognize this problem. The prophet Jeremiah asked, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? Jesus himself clearly showed the punishment theodicy was inadequate to explain evil and suffering when he asked in Luke 13, or those 18 who died when the tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were the, the most guilty? They were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will perish. Do we all need to repent? Do we all need to, you know, would that make the world a better place? Yes, it certainly would. But it doesn't explain all the evil and suffering in the world. Probably the most popular theodicy related to the problem of evil and suffering in the world is the, th is the free will theodicy. This theodicy says God wanted us to have the ability to freely choose whether we were going to love him or not, to freely choose good or to have other choices. But for there, that to be possible, there had to be a real alternative, real options with real consequences. Thus, the possibility to reject God and choose evil, which results in suffering. So God didn't create evil and suffering. God just created the potential for it. Human beings actualized that potential when they chose not to love God and not to do good. This theodicy states that God's problem is not that God's unable to stop suffering. God's problem is God's love and that he wants us to be able to freely choose. Do we want to be, spend eternity with him or not? Do we want to love him or do we not? Do we want to do what is right and what we know in our hearts is right? Or do we want to do what's wrong just because that's what we want to do? God wants to give us the freedom to love and to experience love, to live our lives as we choose because and, and, and so, for a time, he allows disobedience. Remember, the Bible says God is love. Now, in this theodicy, love, then, is the highest value, the, the giving you the ability to love and, and to choose. The only thing to make true love possible is to give us the option to reject that love, which is to reject God. The Bible says all of human history is a love story of people who are given the ability to love and are loved by God, but they reject the love of their creator who made all of creation in such a way that true love would be possible. Now, free will is a compelling argument, and I'm convinced it's part of the answer. Once again, it points to us as the problem, not God. We are a big part of the problem. Why do you lock your doors at night? To keep God out or to keep human criminals away? 
God can end most of the evil and suffering in the world right now by taking away our ability to choose to do what's wrong. But then we'd be robots and not humans, and the possibility to love would be lost. But critics raise the question, is free will a good enough reason to justify all the evil and suffering in the world? If my child, let's suppose I have a child and I've told my child, we live by a highway and it's very busy highway. Don't ever go out on that highway. And then I see that my child has kicked a ball and it's gone across the road or they've got a friend on the other side and I see them running toward the road. Do I stay in there and say, well, I've told them again and again, if they just get run over, they just get run over? Of course not. I, because I love them, I rush, you know, to tackle them if I have to. If it breaks their arm when I tackle them, I don't care. I'm saving their life. Why doesn't God intervene in the worst cases? Well, sometimes God does. That's called a miracle. Usually God doesn't. Perhaps the reason is God would have to intervene all the time. If I was going to use a wood beam to build a house, it'd have to be solid and rigid. But if I was going to take that same beam and use it to smack you in the head, it would have to be as soft as foam. If I was going to uh, cook you dinner, the knife would need to stay rigid and sharp so I could prepare the dinner for you. But if I was going to stab you with it, it'd have to turn into rubber. In other words, there'd be no predictable laws of nature or ordered universe in which we could live our lives and learn and grow as we face the consequences of our actions. This brings me to the final theodicy I'm going to talk about this morning, the temporary state theodicy. Human free will and the pain and suffering that comes from its abuse are a temporary state. Now, science and theology agree that this universe is temporary. Life as we know it will someday come to an end. The Bible says that while the physical universe God created and we experienced was very good and perfect for accomplishing its created perfect purpose, it wasn't perfect in the same sense God is perfect. And it's not the ultimate final perfected product, but just an interim step on the way to our final state in a new heaven and a new earth. The Bible is filled with the concept of the temporariness of this world. Not only does the Bible point out the brevity of each of our lives, it says, you know, our lives are like a morning fog. The Bible also points to the coming end of the world. The prophet Isaiah quotes God as saying, Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be rem remembered, nor will they come to mind. Or the, prof or the prophet John speaks of his revelation from God. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Or the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 8, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So what the temporary state theodicy says is God allows temporary evil limited by the artificial construct of time in order to allow free humans to have the ability to choose to love, to learn, to grow as they experience the consequences of their own choices and the choices of others. Now, what this means is God knew when he gave people a free will, we'd, we were going to make wrong choices and that evil choices could cause suffering. And for a powerful person like a Putin or some other dictator, you know, their wrong choices can lead to the suffering of millions of people. But because our lives are so short compared to the uncountable trillions and trillions of e e eternity and because God is powerful enough to make all things new, to make all things right in eternity, God allows this brief life as a kindergarten training class for eternity. This life has all the conditions necessary for us to grow and learn. For the same reason that you risk letting your children fall down, scrape their knees, and maybe even crack their skull open as they learn to ride a bicycle, God lets us face the many difficulties of this life so we can grow and mature. As I said before, we inoculate our babies. We let our children have surgeries. We let them have the risk of going to camp and traveling and endure doing many other things that have potential for the, uh, difficulty or short-term pain because we, we know those things could give them long-term benefit. Why is it unloving for God, a loving Heavenly Father, to do the same thing? 
But pastor, isn't there a less painful way for us to have the freedom to love and learn and grow? Well, we have no way of knowing. But even if there was another way, evil and suffering wouldn't prove God doesn't exist. It'd just prove that God doesn't do things the way we'd like for Him to do it. The Apostle Paul, who was whipped and stoned and imprisoned and shipwrecked as he served God, said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Mother Teresa, she, as she ministered in India and saw all the pain, you know, in her letters after her death, it came out that she would sometimes have doubts in God. But she kept on working among the poor. She kept on praying. She kept on pointing them to Christ. And she said, ultimately, that all of this world's suffering someday when we're in heaven, she said, the worst suffering in this world will not seem like any more than one inconvenient night in a bad hotel. The Apostle Paul wrote, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. So the Bible asserts that the suffering of this world is very temporary, and the Bible goes on to list throughout its pages many of the benefits of suffering. We don't usually think about the benefits. But the Bible points to a number of benefits. First of all, suffering directs us away from sin. Psalm 119.67, the psalmist says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your words. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. A lot of people can give testimonies like that. You know, I thought drugs or drinking all the time, I thought it'd be a great thing. And then, you know, I learned by experience, not such a great thing. You know, uh, secondly, the Bible says that, uh, you know, it points us to God suffering can. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9 writes, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. So our suffering points us to God. Third, the Bible says it shapes our character. Paul writes in Romans 5, not only so, but we also rejoice in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. A fourth benefit of suffering, the Bible says, it helps us understand our need for others. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 and 27, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. God created us to live in community, but our tendency is, you know, I'm just going to look out for myself. God wants us to help one another and to receive help from one another. And, and uh, you know, it's our pain and suffering many times that drives us to, uh, to, to look for the help of others. Fifth, the Bible says it encourages us to meet the needs of others. In 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our, our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Those are just some of the biblical benefits listed for those who've endured pain and suffering. But there are also practical reasons that God allows us to experience pain. I mean, if you were born without the ability to feel pain, when you leaned on a hot stove, you know, you just leave your hand there till it burned off instead of quickly pulling it away. If you sat down on something sharp, you wouldn't jump up if you couldn't feel the pain. Now, we could go, I could go on and on. You could, if, even if I could tell you uh, all the benefits of pain and suffering for our character development, and for our spiritual development, and all the physical reasons that we needed to pay. And if we could understand all the reasons that God would create an environment where choice was necessary so that love would be possible, it still wouldn't help one bit as you watched your mother slowly die of cancer, or saw a child beaten and raped by a cruel gang. Our hearts cry out within us, this is wrong, it's so wrong. Even Jesus, as he hung on the cross in the midst of his pain and suffering, cried out to God, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There are those moments when we're not going to understand. In the final anal analysis, I think there's a great mystery about suffering. The message of the Bible is God came into this world in Jesus Christ to ultimately defeat sin, evil, suffering, and death. But ironically, the way that God did that was by choosing to suffer himself. 
Jesus endured sin, evil, suffering, and death. Hebrews 2.10, in bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom and, and by whom everything exists should make the author of their suffering, perf I mean, offer, author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Jesus, like us, anguishes over the suffering, the suffering of the world. You know, how many times when, before Jesus did a miracle, does it say he looked upon them and he had compassion? Jesus, as he anticipates his own suffering on the cross in the Garden of Gethsemane, not just physical suffering, but the spiritual suffering of taking the sins of the world, he, he, he prays, let this cup pass from me. God, isn't there another way besides the way of the cross? But not my will, but thy will be done. We understand so, so little about all that the cross means and all that happens. If I had time this morning, I'd go through the temptations of Jesus, and, every, and I don't. Every one of those temptations, you know, is Jesus basically saying, no, you know, I'm not going to use supernatural power to turn stones into bread, or I'm not going to bow down to you for the kingdoms of the world. I'm not going to take a shortcut, you know, and bypass the suffering in the hard way or the highest point of the temple. You know, you don't have to go through a cross, you know, in order to have a kingdom. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world, Satan says. In Philippians 3.10, Paul prays to know Christ, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering. Cesar Chavez, at the end of his famous 1968 fast for fair wages and better conditions for migrant workers, said, When we are really honest with ourselves, we must admit that our lives are all that really belong to us. So it's how we use our lives that determine what kind of people we are. It is my deepest belief that only by giving our lives to, do we find life. I am convinced that the truest act of courage, the strongest act of humanity, is to sacrifice ourselves for others in a totally nonviolent struggle for justice. To be human is to suffer for others. God, help us to be human. Jesus said if we'd find our life, we would lose it. If we lose our life for his sake, we'll find it. We're never going to completely understand the problem of evil and suffering, but we can participate in the mystery of Christ's suffering with Christ. And as we do, the Bible says, as we turn our own personal suffering over to Christ and as we work to alleviate the suffering of others, we are made fit for the eternal kingdom of God where there isn't going to be any more evil or pain or suffering. That's why we need Christ in our life, not just to die for our sins so we can go to heaven someday, but to teach us how to trust and love God who's in heaven and to love and serve others in the midst of the world that we find ourselves right now. What's amazing to me is that there's so much beauty, you know, in this world and so much love in light of all of our rebellion. And each one of us has rebelled and said we're going to do our own thing. And like a stone thrown into a pool that has ripple effects on other people all around us and sometimes throughout the ages. It always was hard on me when I was younger and I first started traveling overseas. You know, I would go to refugee camps and to leper colonies. And I would find Christians there. And there was laughter, and there was faith, and there was love, and there was e even hope when it seemed to me hopeless, and they had nothing, and there was dirt on the floor, and, you know, they were wearing rags. They had nothing by our standards. And then I'd come home, and Americans who had everything, even American Christians, all they seemed to do was complain and be miserable all the time, even though we, compared to the rest of the world, have nothing to be miserable about. You see, I think many times we, we ask the wrong question. We shouldn't be asking, you know, how if there's a good God can be there so much evil in the world. We should be asking, since we're all so rebellious and choose our own way and so selfish, how can there be so much love, especially for those who are in Jesus Christ? How can there be so much hope? How can there be so much peace? How can there be so much beauty? The mystery of evil and suffering. There's a lot to think about. Whole libraries of books written on the subject. I hope you'll think about it, but I think what you'll find in your own personal life, if you turn to God, you may not understand the reasons for evil and suffering, but you'll understand that there's a God who loves you and who's with you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I know many people, even in this room, have been through painful situations and suffering. Some have lost spouses far too soon. Some have lost children. 
Some, Father, have been betrayed by friends, business partners. Father, there have been all kinds of things people have faced that are in this room. I pray, Father, that they'd be able to take all of that hurt to you and to know that you do love, love them, just like the, the wonderful song that Sharon sang, the simple children's song, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. Fathers, we come to you, we find you do love us, and you do forgive us, even though we don't deserve your love or forgiveness. Father, I pray that each person in, in here might experience that love and forgiveness and power through Jesus Christ, and that you would help us to trust you even when we don't understand why things are happening the way that they are. Help us to know, as your word says, it's not because you're not a good God and not because you love us. And your promise is you can give back the years the locusts have eaten, Father. You can, you can, Father, heal any of the hurts that we suffer in this world. Help us just to trust you and take everything to you. And help us to point others to a God who will give them love and hope and forgiveness in a world that's often so very difficult. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.